Hello, producer Pete here. And just before the show begins, please, will you consider becoming one of our esteemed patrons? For just a dollar a show, you can help Latopia After Dark to achieve our aim, which is to come out on a regular weekly schedule. Latopia After Dark is quite unlike anything else out there, either on the net or on conventional broadcast media. We're not an ego fest, and we don't have a narrow, exclusive agenda like so much of public service broadcasting. Quite simply, we aim to bring the most interesting people in the world round to your place for a late-night chat about what's going on. Interesting, informative, entertaining and absolutely unique. Supporters from just a dollar a show. More if you can. And patrons get lots of other benefits too. It's all on the website, shortlink latopia.tv slash lad. And now, on with the show. I'm here, you fucking shits, and you have not killed me. I survived. Your hand, my bottom. Contact happened. What do you mean you didn't mean it? This is the fucking holiest sight in the world for Muslims, and you have come here to grope a woman's ass? We don't get the chance as Muslim women to talk about these things. You're going to get me killed here. This is my religion. Stop it. Live and uncensored. Uncensored. Let's talk about the different types of headscarves worn by Muslim women. There's the hijab, which covers the head and neck but leaves the face exposed. There's the niqab, which takes things a step further and covers the face except for the eyes. They've uh, banned the niqab in France for a variety of reasons, walking into a bank essentially wearing a mask being one of them. There's the burqa, which covers the face with a mesh window. Think of a hazmat suit, only without the arms, transparent faceplate, or protection against Ebola. Okay, okay, I I sense people are getting uncomfortable. So, keeping within the never-controversial subject of women's rights in the Middle East, let's talk about the hymen. Yes, that slippery, hot-button membrane located deep within... You know what? (laughs) I'm probably not the best guy to talk about these issues. Because no guy is the best guy to talk about these issues. The best guy to talk about these issues is, I don't know, not a guy. And certainly not a priest, a rabbi, an imam, or a room full of male politicians. Gentlemen, it's time to pass the microphone, or at least to share. Equally, stick around, ladies. I'm almost done. Intelligent listening for dangerous minds. This is Latopia. This is Latopia. Latopia after dark. After dark. After dark. After dark. Welcome, everyone. I'm Ian Wynn, the Technopagan Octopus Messiah, here with super producer who's never worn <laughs> anything pucer, Mr. Peter Cox. I'm here representing Latopia.com. Tonight, our guest is acclaimed journalist, commentator, feminist, Muslim, and self-inflicted ginger, Mona el Tahawe, author of Hymens and Headscarves, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. She's going to talk her teenage years in Saudi Arabia, sexual assault at the hands of the Egyptian security forces and story after story, oh my God, after story, Allah, sorry, of women suffering atrocities at the hands of men across the Middle East. She's written for the New York Times, Reuters, Washington Post, The Guardian, oh, it goes on and on, CNN, the BBC, Channel 4 just had her on last night. Mona, welcome to the show. Hello, Ian. <laughs> All right, so uh, now it's time for you to get a word in edgewise. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm watching Channel 4, as we do. We had Lindsay Hilsom, their international um, yes. news editor, on a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And um, you were, they, they had you on in some kind of a panel. And, or there were a couple, there was another woman there, a Berkeley professor named Saba Mahmoud. And she just straight out, ad, she's saying that your position is that uh, Arab culture needs to be thrown out. And uh, that's what that's what you're all about. And I've been reading your book, and I've followed you a bit online. And I'm thinking, I I missed something. Is that what you're? Is that what it's all about with you? Just throw it all out and start over, like burn no. down the mosques and no. state your position for the record. 
Well, I, as I told her, I, there is nowhere that she could point to where I've said I want to throw out Arab culture. I've said there's a toxic mix of culture and religion in the various countries in the Arabic speaking parts of the Middle East and North Africa. But I always find it interesting when I get put head to head with an academic, especially an academic in Berkeley of all places, you know, so like you've got this really kind of cushy, privileged position and you know, I'm the person out on the ground in Egypt talking, trying to document these horrors that are happening and saying that we need a social sexual revolution in order for women to be free. And without women's freedom and, and without women's equality, we will never be free as countries anyway. And I always get this academic that comes up and, you know, wants to argue over the meaning of culture. So it's not about jargon for me and it's not about semantics for me. It's about, you know, the real fucking world. Whenever somebody starts going into semantics of your argument, you know their argument's not very good. It's they're not talking about the issues. They just want to break down like, oh, how could and something she was uh, someone else was uh, arguing on the BBC. They were putting you up against the wall about using misogyny. It's not misogyny. Oh, it's God. Oh, that was even better. This was a white Englishman who was upset that I wanted to call it misogyny. And I'm like, dude, you live in London. You're a white man in London. I, lo I'm I love that. Muslim woman in Egypt who are you talking about <laughs> but see this is where this is where the the sort of the divorce between reality and 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 theory and you run into liberals in the west as well as conservatives who argue the semantics talk to me about the gropathon that is the streets of Cairo you mean the real life right the real the, life exactly the I mean, war zone that i prepare myself for when i exit my house now you live half your time in cairo and half in new york well i know I, I live most of my time now in cairo i do travel back and forth to new york to do to give lectures and stuff but since 2013 i've lived mostly in cairo i went back i'm originally from egypt so I've been in Cairo for the past two years and, you know, odd few months here and there. And I'm always amazed when people, like I said, you know, want to argue about theory and they want to argue about words. And I want to talk about the real the real world. I want to talk about what it's like to be in a, a girl and a woman in a country where the United Nations says 99.3% of girls and women have reported being sexually harassed. And where my friends and I say that 0.7% probably just didn't have their phone on them when they got called for the survey. So it's like, come on. It's on. It's absolutely unreal. The one of one another one of our guests is a um, professor of gender gender equality and uh, gender studies in uh, Cal State Pomona. Another. California professor. When I sent her uh, the interview at Channel, your interview at Channel Four, she hadn't realized that it was so bad in Egypt. Because when you in the West, when you think about Egypt, think a modern country. We go, you know, my parents just went on a, you know, on a cruise down the Nile, and ninety percent female gen genital mutilation, exactly. uh, almost a hundred percent sexual assault. What? what when I first went to Egypt in 97, I thought, wow, what a great country. People welcomed me. Yes. It, there had been a massacre two weeks before, and people were very welcome. And they were, why, why are you here? Mm. And so I was so excited. I was all G'd up on Egypt. Mm. And I brought my wife back and had a completely different experience. She hated it. She's like, you left. How dare you leave me to go to the bathroom when I'm on the beach? There was a guy kneeling by my lounger trying to massage me within 30 seconds. What is it like for you to walk the streets? I'm so glad you brought up your wife because, because you know, often you get a man who visits Egypt or an Egyptian man and then his experience is completely remote from the experience of a woman, a woman friend. It's, it's almost like you're telling two parallel stories of two different countries. So yes, clearly it's very different for a woman. It's very different. You know, as soon, as soon as you leave your house, you prepare for a barrage of insulting remarks, offensive remarks, someone saying, so, you know, it, they can range from innocuous if you want, you know, hey baby this, hey baby that. Even that I don't appreciate, you know, first thing in the morning or any time of the day. Even if you're looking good? Even if I'm looking good and hot, thank you very much. I don't need to know from you. Right. Oh, well, okay, but someone maybe not as creepy as me. Well, well, you, know, you know what? I'll tell you one remark that I got that I appreciated and then I was so surprised because the guy was so polite that I, it took me a few seconds and I wanted to say thank you, but he'd already gone because I was shocked. I was just crossing the street to go and pay my, my phone bill. Pay attention, gentlemen. And this guy, right, right, take notes. And this guy goes to me, I like the color of your hair. And I was like, oh my God, you know, there was no profanity. There was no, I want to do this to you. There was no attempt to touch or grope me. The guy just paid me an honest to God compliment. I was so shocked. So by the time I turned to look for him to say thank you, he'd gone. So it's, it's so you He was terrified. The worst. He knew that you had the rape alarm and the, and the pepper spray. You, you know what he was going to get? And, and this, this, it gets to, now obviously it depends on how safe you feel. 
because you can't always do this. But a few weeks before I left Cairo, I was out with a friend of mine in an old part of Cairo going to have dinner with another group. So it was two men waiting for me and, and a female friend. And this guy, I could see that there was something wrong with him because he suddenly veered towards my direction and groped me as if nothing had happened, just like that. So I turned around and I was like, what the fuck? And I began to, I smacked him, I spat at him, I kicked him. He was hiding behind the satchel that he was carrying. And he kept saying, I didn't mean it. I was like, what the hell do you mean I didn't mean it? Your hand, my bottom, contact happened. What do you mean you didn't mean it? He crossed the street. You know what happened? He angled. I, I, no, what, right. He, he determined right trajectory. So I was smacking him so hard and so determined to just do something to him. He actually jumped over the traffic divider and ran away. I have never had a man run away from me before. I was so proud. Yeah, nice work. Nice <laughs> work. One and only time so far. Something you may not know about the uh, the Muslim world uh, is that it has some of the best snorkeling on earth. You, Indonesia, Malaysia. Egypt, the Red Sea. Egypt, the Red Sea. That's where I was I was mo mm -hmm. moving my way north uh, northwest to, to, to get up there. And so I, I said, you know, I said to my wife, let's go check it out. It's, it's some of the fish in the Red Sea are found nowhere else. And the first thing was the was the harassment. You know, I would leave to go to the beach or, or to, you know, pick up some, something in town. And the room boy would come in and hit and hit on her and say, hey, you know, I, your husband has just left. So and then other women are reporting the same thing. And I'm not seeing it. Right. Yes. So then we go on. Um, we, we we rent some horses to get to a, a really kind of remote place where there's no roads. And I love it. I never get to be on a horse. I'm so excited. Mm. So I get on and I say, can I gallop? And he says, yeah, go ahead. So I go off galloping down the beach. He's meanwhile has been totally polite, absolutely lovely the whole time. Says to my, do you want to learn? She says, well, yeah. I sort of, she says, well, here. And he goes and gets on her horse and springs a boner. Okay. Oh my God. In her back. Oh. And now she, my, she's a tough cookie. She's half tattooed. She's been through shit. She's been raped. She's been, you know, abused by her husband. She's like, you know, but there was, for her, it was kind of like, you got to be kidding me. You're you sad a little man. Yeah. 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 You're on a horse. And I don't know if you've known of had sexual harassment on a horse, but so <sighs> that she. That hasn't so far happened to me. Yeah. Well, give it time. <laughs> uh, so she didn't tell me until we'd put on our, our gear and we were half, you know, a good half mile offshore at this reef. Oh God. And she, she says, put your, put your head up. And she told me what happened. And then she grabbed me. She's like, do not, because he was the brother of the police right. chief of that, you know, of right. that area. Right. She's like, do not cause a scene. We're going to go back. I'm like, I'm going to kill him. She's like, just don't tip him. And I was furious, Mona. I was just I know. furious. I know. And do you do you tool up do you always go out in a group yeah. how do you how do you navigate nightlife in cairo because people yeah. you know it's becoming more and more conservative you know and it pains me deeply to say this but you know travel advisories usually say things like we warn travelers not to go to x whatever area because things explode or because there because are of terrorism. turbulence because of whatever egypt mm. now people women tourists are warned that there is an epidemic of street sexual harassment this is something that egypt unfortunately and shamefully has become associated with. So how do I deal with it? Well, you know, it depends, you know, on the, so I'll yell, um, I'll smack if I can get a hold of them, but you often they'll just kind of get by so quickly and they do it so surreptitiously. It's not always as obvious as on a horse and you know who's behind you because you turn around and the guy acts like, oh, 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 the sun's out today. So you can't even tell sometimes who the guy is. And then sometimes you don't feel safe enough to do it because um, a few months ago, we had a young woman who drowned because she jumped into the Nile to avoid a man who was molesting her. <laughs> so, and, and another time we had a 17 year old boy who was stabbed to death because he was trying to defend a woman being harassed. So, you know, these are life and death situations here. So you, you, it's, it's really, really difficult to, 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 to put up with it. It's really difficult to have to brace yourself to go out. And then, and you know, sometimes you just say, fuck it. I want to wear a dress today and I'm going to wear a dress and just wear it. I'm going to show my arms. I'm going to show my arms. It's hot. Seriously. When I wear a dress, I'm like Twitterland because I call it Twitterland. I I'm wearing a dress and I don't give a fuck what anyone says. And I walk down the street in Cairo and it feels like an achievement that I'm wearing a dress walking down the street in Cairo. And this should not be the case because 30 or 40 years ago, my mother yeah. and all her friends were this wearing dresses and no one was doing anything. So the question is, what has happened in the past 30 or 40 years? Well, this is again. You bring up your your parents walking around looking like women in Paris of the same I of the you. same age. Exactly. The the thing the the second thing aside from the and the harassment continued to the point where like 
if you want me to go and, you know, you want to go visit Alexandria, I will be 70 years old. Like, <laughs> that's that's the deal. We're not going back till she's 70. Yeah. And fair enough. The other thing was, where are the women? They're not working in the hotels. They're not you know, they're not even janitors. Yep. They're not at the well, front well, the desk. Clean your room up. No. The, all men. All men. Everywhere. Uh-huh. The restaurants. Yes. The um. The, the, they needed a female voice. So, so one, uh, one of the Egyptian men at the place we were staying had married a West, had married a Brit, and she mm. was there manning the manning the phones. Mm. And where are they? Where are the women? The guy who who molested my wife. It was during Ramadan. Okay, so oh my God. so you're thinking, here's a guy who won't go swimming because he doesn't want to get a drop of water to right. pass his lips, right. and you think, wow, that's really devout. And meanwhile, he's going around on this, you know, this gropathon tour of women in Egypt, and his wife is fenced into a room in in God, I mean, the hundred degree heat, and in Perda, where are where are the the women? So when you come out and you write your book, and I heard you give a, a lecture at the Sydney Opera House, I was like, oh, thank God. You know, somebody's finally coming out because this is, I mean, it's ridiculous. And when I hear the academics attack you. Over the meaning of culture. Yes, or I don't think misogyny is the right word. It's more of a misanthropy that's directed towards women. No, this, they hate people. This is awful. So. This is war, dude. This is what, it's war. And where are the women? We are engaged in what we need to be engaged in, which is what my whole book is about. The social sexual revolution that basically says, fuck this shit, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. <laughs> because, you know, you know, it got so bad when we could still protest. Right now in Egypt, we can't protest. So certain levels of street sexual harassment and, sex, and mob so- sexual assaults have been on, on the decrease because we're not allowed to protest in Egypt anymore. And what would happen in the protest was... Because so what- last time you were allowed to protest, look what you did. Exactly. And last time we last time we, we protested and the men saw that the women were outside of the house. The men saw that the women were taking over public space and saying, We're here and we're not going back home. Something and now you as a man you have to you have to talk about this as well. This this gut fear that you as men get when you see women unleashed, women saying we're not gonna take this anymore. Because what ended up ha- happening right. to the women in the protest was they get these mob organized mob sexual assaults that would surround one or two women, tear their clothes off. And just go for it. And just horrific levels of sexual violence. Now, what women started to do to defend themselves was, sometimes women would go out in the protests and there were pictures carrying kitchen knives, basically saying, bring it. Because you bring it and I will cut you. You okay, know that now, I will cut you? Now, now I am scared. Carrying I, knives. Your hair is nice, but I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> She's got a knife. What's it? Some women now go out with mace and there were other groups mm. of women who organized things like Tahrir Bodyguard and all these anti-sexual harassment and sexual assault groups. And you know what they would do? They would have men and women and their sole job was to follow a protest and as soon as they see a woman being surrounded by the mob, not take those guys to the police not fight them because those guys would often have switchblades of their own they would just go in there extricate this woman if she'd been stripped naked surround her with clothes and get her out get her out that's how bad it was but but we're fighting back see one of the things that i'm accused of that i think is really unfair is that i'm i'm told you make us all look like helpless victims which i i utterly refuse anyone who gives my book a fair reading will see i'm not dude you put 20 guys around me i'm a helpless victim Exactly right. So what I, what I am doing is I'm naming I mean, and I'll, shaming. I'll, 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 I'll wipe them out like Bruce Lee, but still, yeah, you know, right. we're all Bruce Lee, right? right? In our heads, of course. But see, you, I was surrounded by four riot police, and they broke my arms. What can I do when when four people, four men, beat me? To okay, the I, that they break my arms. I want but I want to get to that, but I want to finish my sentence. What I do in my book? You though, always want to finish your sentence. I've been watching you. Do of course. I, why do you think I came <laughs> to listen to you? <laughs> no, 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 no. This this is now. I'm stuff. sad. This is serious, Ian. Yes, I know. And I will listen to you eventually. Uh, My book is about how bad it is, but also how much we have to fight against and that we are fighting against it. So if you give my book a fair reading, you will see that, yes, I lay out the shit, but I also say we are fighting that shit. That's what I'm doing. That's what I find so refreshing about it. And I'm working my, I generally do my reading at night. It's how I fall asleep. You get nightmares if you read my book before. That's, you what I, that's what's happening. You know, it's, it's like, why are you still awake? It's 1 a.m. I say, because I'm furious. Exactly. You know, so I'm going to recommend people uh, read the book, but maybe not right before bed. Um, <laughs> you, I'd like to back it up just a little bit to get your, um, just to kind of bring people into your story, which is fascinating in itself. You were born in Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, then you lived in the UK. Yeah, came here exactly 40 years ago. Okay. Yeah, you didn't have to do that. I would never have asked. Um, 
What part? Of, what part of the UK you were in? Scotland. London. No, you were in London, London for most of the time, and then we were in Glasgow for the last nine months of our stay here. And then your parents, who were doctors, moved you to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And you were how old? You were fifteen. So right at the time where you're like boys, uh, hormones, rebellion. This is like when this is the most difficult time for you to be a child. Anyway, they move you to the most I mean kids get upset because they got to be home by 10 yeah. at 15 yeah. and suddenly you're t- you're in Jeddah t- t- take me there get off you get off the plane yeah. what is your first it's hot then what yeah. oh it's like an oven honestly no exaggeration and then and then it's like someone turned the lights off I was like, what is this planet that we have moved to? For a really, really long time, I was furious at my parents. Like, how could you do this to me? I mean, now, you know, now that I am almost 48, older than they were when they moved to Saudi Arabia, I know why they moved there. I mean, my my dad couldn't find a job during that last year in Glasgow. My mother was the breadwinner and he was the house husband. You know, he'd, he'd cook dinner, have it ready for her when she came back from work. He'd come pick us up from school. But according to visa regulations at the time, the father was the head of the household and he had to have a job so that we could get our residency papers. Right. So, you know, he's like, you know, great, wonderful. Great so even though your mom is a com- completely competent yeah, doctor, she's got it she had to know. ride the. But we couldn't get our visas extended in the UK because my dad didn't have a job and you get it through your dad back then. Yeah. Right. Of course. So we had to leave. So my parents found jobs in Saudi Arabia where, you know, they were both teaching medical school. They were both teaching medical students and teaching the, the technicians who then worked with them in the lab. So they both had very fulfilling jobs. But I'm 15 years old and this is the worst place on earth to move to as a 15 year old girl. W- was your conversation with them around the dinner table to start every day with I why do you, you hate me? <laughs> Why do you hate me? Yes. Why did you do this to me? Yes. As if your rule wasn't bad enough, you've got to put me under the bloody sheiks? Yeah. You, you know, well, you know what I felt, honestly, I mean, before I fell into a deep depression, because I did for several yeah. years, I mean, that's the only, the only reaction. I felt like I had split into two. And the real Mona was back here in the UK waiting for me going, you know what? I'm not coming over there, dude. I'm hanging out here. You go out there and you pretend to do the exams in the school and stuff. I'm sure if I talked to a psychiatrist about this, they'd come up with some kind of syndrome of what happened to me. And it was like this fake me was going through the motions in Saudi because it was just too painful. And and then I was just, it just got worse and worse. I felt like I was being suffocated. You know, I, I was brought up a Muslim. I was, yeah, that's my next but question. Not not that kind of Islam. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is this? You were a reformed Jew suddenly being <laughs> going Hasidic. <laughs> We're reconstructionists going all the way to Mia Sharim, you know? So like upside down. So what did your how did your parents react? Did your mom did your mom veil up? Well yeah my mom see this is the interesting thing. We went on pilgrimage very soon after we arrived. Mm. You know, according to Muslim teaching. Yeah, one of the five pillars, yeah. Five pillars. And when you go to pilgrimage it's like your your slate of sin is erased clean. So you're like born again, you start again. Oh all the hatred would leave. Fantastic. All gone. Yeah. And so for women who believe that wearing a headscarf is an obligation, they begin to wear it then and that's so my mother did because my mother does you know and I often use my mother as, as an example of you know she's got a PhD in medicine this is a very intelligent woman we disagree about the headscarf now but she still wears it and so you for, still hold a bit of a grudge no you know what I don't <laughs> we've gotten to the stage in life now where we're at this lovely impasse where we don't argue every time we're in the same room leave us at it it okay. takes long enough to get there so here so you, you go to Mecca yes so we go to so my mum does after it but you know so here I am preparing to go to the holy sites and it's the first time in my life I'm wearing hijab which as you described it then you know in your furious intro everything but your face and hands are covered I look like an, a nun I had just spent the last year in Glasgow at Notre Dame Catholic School for Girls so I know what nuns look like right. look myself in the mirror I look like a nun wearing white most modest quote unquote I've ever looked in my life and we're out there doing the rituals and we're going round, you know, the cubicle structure called the Kaaba. Yeah. And I feel a hand on my backside. I'm like, no, this isn't happening. No, no, no. I'm imagining. And this guy is persistent. I mean, he went. He He's going out, for he it. A mission. You know, he like was going for it. This is the fucking holiest sight in the world for Muslims. And you have come here to grope a woman's ass. I just, I couldn't get my head around this. Mon, I don't want to, I don't want to take this away from you, but I don't think you were the only ass he groped. I, you know what? I have a feeling you're absolutely right. I know you want to feel like you're special, but. But that's what makes me even more furious, Ian, that this guy would go take advantage of the fact that you've got thousands upon thousands of people. Everybody's pressed together. Trying to, you know, devote ourselves to the spiritual atmosphere. Hand up my ass. What would have happened if he'd been caught? How would he have been caught? Well, see, that's the thing. It's so crowded. You can't even turn around. And then, and I, I am 15 years old. No one has ever touched me like that before. 
And I'm like, oh my God. And I don't even have the words for it. I burst into tears. My parents are like, what's wrong? What's wrong? I make up some bullshit excuse about how it's crowded. I can't take it anymore. So we go to a less crowded area. I hate you guys. Area. Yeah. <laughs> no, it hasn't built in yet. <laughs> so we go to a less crowded area and then we go back again into the main hall of the Grand Mosque. And it's time to em- embrace what we call the black stone. Ironically enough, the black stone, you know, according to kind of like, you know, Muslim story. Right, was, it used to be well, pure to be white and yeah. Heaven and no. it's now like, you know, black with the sins of humanity. Tell me about it yeah. because we're about to embrace this black stone. It's part of the rituals. And there's a Saudi policeman there who shoes the men aside and says, it's the women's turn now. So you think, you know what? I'm going to be safe because this Saudi policeman, he's making space for me. And it's also your mother is teaching women. Your father is teaching is, is teaching men. Everything exactly. is totally separated. But around, the, in that mosque, men and women are together because you know it's the holy right, right, site right. you know you should behave so I'm, I'm bending down to embrace this this is the worst disco ever it's horrendous <laughs> sorry <laughs> maybe some music would have made it no I'm kidding you're gonna get me killed here this is my religion no Stop no no it. my, no it's fine my, I'm just trying to get Pete killed so uh, <laughs> no I wouldn't people. I wouldn't let me finish my story this is horrible so I, I bend I wouldn't down. dream of stopping it I embrace this black stone and the Saudi policeman gropes my breast the Saudi policeman who is supposed to be protecting the women from the men gropes my breast. At this point, my brain is ready to just depart, depart this world. I just, I cannot get a handle on this. Okay, that beats the Ramadan boner on the horse it's story. Awful. This is the holiest site for Muslims, man. I just could not believe it. So we go back home to Jeddah, right. where, where we live, right? And I told my parents, you know what? I'm going to start wearing hijab. And they're like, no, you're too young. You're 15. <laughs> I just want to hide. Yeah. You know, this, this thing about teenage girls hiding, and, and this is where, you know, whenever I have a conversation like this in a non-Muslim environment, my, my instinct is to defend Muslims against anyone who would say, oh my God, these barbaric Muslim men. Clearly what happened to me is just totally out of order. But I want to connect it to something global because it's clearly not just Muslim men who do this. And when it comes to teenage girls and this need to hide our bodies, especially developing bodies and we're not comfortable with, you know, the way men are responding to, you know, breasts and hips and all that. It, it is a bit exciting. Stop it or I'll turn, come over and smack <laughs> you and make you run away. Okay, I'm, a, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I was afraid when Where you walked in. Wife? Where's your wife? Yeah, What's the believe, her name? Don't worry, her name is Kat and I'll get it when I get home. You, Tats? Okay, look, I've got enough ink here, okay? You so, do? I would like to get to those. So, okay. Right, we will. Anyway, so I have a very good friend who went to Italy when she was 15. She was blonde and, you know, Italian men back then, I don't know if the same now, with blonde women especially, she was telling me something goes berserk. And they kept groping her and molesting her as a 15-year-old in Italy. And she said as soon as she went back to New York, where she's from, she began to wear baggy clothes because she just wanted to hide. So there, there's a thing that happens, and we have to talk about this, is to, to, to girls and young women, as we begin to develop and, you know, we, we're coming into our own as, as women and we see how men react to us, some of us just want to hide. And so the way I wanted to hide was to just put on a hijab and say, get in the tent. Exactly. But you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't protect you. Assholes will be assholes. Tent or not. This is Gary Busher with the electrifying sound of the courtesans. Just one of the brilliant new indie bands we feature on The Hungry and the Hunted. If you believe that rock and pop should be wild, infectious and dangerous, then join me for The Hungry and the Hunted here on Litopia. Do you hate me? You could never hate me. So you you decide to put on the you put on the hijab. You don't yes. go for the fa- you don't go for the niqab. No, I never went for the niqab. So you're wearing this cloak essentially. I'm in wearing abaya, which in Saudi is the tradition. Yep. 100, 110, 120 degrees during summer. I'm imagining back then the air conditioning was not in every building, and you're walking the streets in this yeah. m- portable sauna just so in the, in the failed hope yeah. that you're not going to get groped. And do you think that it stopped? Anybody? So where are you get where are you getting groped on the bus? Like just everywhere. Everywhere, and even when I went back to Egypt, still wearing hijab everywhere, which is which brings us to the point of public space. You know, who owns public space, and who acts entitled to public space, and worse, who acts entitled to women's bodies, 
and it's you know these these asshole men, and over and over. But the ar- the argument is that if you show me an ankle, Mona, I won't be able to resist myself. Well, that's the argument that has to be upended, and that man has to be told you're an asshole, and it's not on me. But it's a to self help you resist. It's a self fulfilling prophecy. I've seen it in in India as well. Uh, I went with some uh, some some lovely young ladies to a, a Hindi movie, and. Uh, there was like you know this sort of eroticized scene where instead they can't kiss each other in the movie, so instead they like lasciviously eat a peach or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And you could sense the testosterone of this sort of adolescent crowd. And when I say adolescent, I mean like twenty-five-year-old adolescents, mm-hmm. men who have not yet been married off. Mm-hmm. And this frenzy builds to the point where the three other guys, we, we had to basically bundle these these girls into a taxi because they were coming at us with this right. sea of hands. And I wonder the cult, the very culture that's saying, "Oh, we're protecting." the modesty of of women, whether it's that same culture that causes such repression in men that they have no outlet. There's no, they don't get to right. talk to women. They see a movie and now on the internet they see porn and they think that's how it is. So if they see an elbow, it's on. Right. We well, see, you know, when we have discussions about sexual violence in a Western context, we often say sexual violence, sexual assault is about power and it's not about sex. It's not about desire, right? This is an established conversation. So if you're raped, it's not because the guy desires you, it's because it's about power. And he's trying to break you and he's trying to show you who's in control. But when that conversation does move into repressive cultures, when that conversation moves into conservative cultures, you do have to add this this element of repression and what it does to you. But you also have to ask the question of who is allowed to express the frustration from that repression. Because, you know, when I I, I had this conversation with um, a film director in Egypt who, and I'm not going to say his name, but he produced, he made a film that looked at sexual violence and, and the way that women, women's bodies are abused in the public space. And I said to him, you know, this idea that it's because men are, men are sexually repressed, but you know what? No one ever talks about women's sexual repression and how we don't go out there groping men. And this guy who I thought was progressive and open-minded says to me, no, 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 but men's sex drive is much higher than women. I was like, get the fuck out. Come on now. I'm frustrated if I'm not having sex. Yeah, Anyone's I'm gonna, frustrated if they're not having I'm gonna sex. Argue his, Come on now. I'm going to argue his corner. No, you can't. Yeah, I can't. You can't. Allow me to try and argue <sighs> his corner in the sense that... Um, and this is borrowing a line from, uh, paraphrasing a line from Joe Rogan, um, essentially that men will blow themselves up in jihad, will strap suicide vests to their, to, to their, you know, to, to their chest and get on a bus and blow up people in the promise of pussy in another dimension. Oh, no. Okay? No, no, that no. is insane. <laughs> if you're willing to do that, to go out there, if you think you're, you haven't had any sexual contact and every, you're going to kill yourself and everyone around you so you can get laid and have a house made of emeralds, made of women, I, I think well, you that... Know what? Women, women, have, do, women are not wi- promised, okay, dick on the other side. If, you were, if they were, if they, they were, be blowing themselves up. If they were... Pro- all right, they're not. Mona, 72... <laughs> you, you, in your book, I'm not outing you here, you say you don't lose your virginity until you're 29. 29. Yes. Okay, so no one promised me to come okay. to the side. So if you were 20, up. if you were 27, and they said, Mona, 72 dicks, line them up, waiting for you if you wear the vest and get on the bus, would you have done it? I think no. No, 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 no. Listen, you know, I thought you were going to say something scientific that I could actually wrestle with here. You oh, there, the you will find no academia here. <laughs> no, okay. Listen, scientifically proven that men and women's sex drives are not different. What What is different is who's allowed to express that sex drive. So it's okay for your, your fictitious jihadi here, whoever he is, for him to be told, you are going to get 72 virgins on the other side. So this is all socially constructed and accepted in some corners. But no woman is told. You know, I have a very good friend of mine who's a poet. She's Syrian-American. She used to write this great column for a progressive Muslim website at the time called Muslim Wake Up. And she started writing this column for it. Fictitious, huh? It was called Sex and the Ummah. And her first essay was, Is There Cock in Heaven? Addressing this very subject, okay, where in her, she, she creates... I've this. got some friends here who certainly <laughs> hope so. <laughs> she's addressing, she, so she's got these five women who go to a prayer circle, okay, and the imam gives them, you know, religious lessons every week. And one of them says to him, excuse me, Mr. Imam, so I hear <laughs> that men are off, you know, they're given all these virgins on the other side, that they get their wives, they get all these beautiful women in, in heaven. What do I get? 
And he goes, your husband. She goes, I don't want him in the, in the, in the next life. I'm done with him. I'm done. What do I get? Where's my cock? I didn't even choose so him. So you see, we have these conversations. So you thought you were going to shock me, right? You're not going to no, shock I, me, mister. Uh, Mona, honestly, after what you've been through, if I shocked you, <laughs> I'd be surprised. So, uh, so, wait, see, so we got to admit here that it's because men are allowed to express this and not women. Okay, but uh, just to go down that street, I mean, you look at pornography, it's geared, from what I've heard, it's geared mostly towards the male sexual appetite. Because it's made by men, but you know there's pornography it's more, made by women It's now. more and more becoming made, becoming made by women. And, and so catering to, to narratives and, and, and film styles that, will, that women will like. So, so, I'm, I'm so you're not, saying I'm that with everything. feminism, the internet porn traffic is going to double in value. So there's an economic argument for, for uh I will recommend to you a book called Feminist Porn. It addresses exactly these issues. Awesome. That sounds great. And it's well, nice and orange and bright and like, yeah, the color is bright orange. It doesn't sound like something that's going to help me fall asleep. <laughs> no. <laughs> it gets a bit academic, unfortunately, at times, but still. So you've um, you've decided after it says you took a year to put on the, the, the hijab yes. and eight years to take it off. Yes. And... Finally, you've you've and, and that there must be an enormous amount of shame involved oh, totally. in taking shame and guilt. What yes. what I see, well, because the part of London where I live is forty percent Bengali Muslim, and I've never lived in that you know with that dynamic. Yeah. Um, and I see women in niqab just coming out out here. I saw a good ten, twelve women in niqab. Mm. Um, and what I see is that the little girls are happily playing on the playground and you know jumping around and laughing, and and then they hit like about eleven, and mm. and I'm not saying all. But there are some sullen-looking little girls mm-hmm. who've been put in the put in the hijab. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They can't run as fast. They can't yeah. climb on the jump. They're children. And they're children, and I feel like you know where ah I don't ah, who am I to who am yeah. I to say? And so when I hear that, well, it's a choice in in uh, in Arab culture. It's yeah. a it's a choice. But is it a choice if your family has pushed you right. into that? Right. Please comment on this because I'm not that guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm not. I'm glad you're not because you know the the word mansplaining, right? No, I, I do. Love it. I love it when men. Mansplain yes. my experience and my my headscarf. I've had enough face. from you, Mona. Let me let me mansplain the rest of your life. <laughs> let me tell um, you why you struggled with the headscarf. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I get that all the time. Believe me. No, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to express what the headscarf. Meant You're to welcome. Me. I never had a hymen either, so we'll. <laughs> So please, we'll turn to the experts. No, this this word choice, I mean, it's a difficult word and we have to wrestle with it because I wrestled with it. Like you said, I wore hijab for nine years. It took me eight years to take it off. Why was it easy or why was it easier to choose to wear it than it was to choose to take it off? So for eight years, you're wearing it going, I really want to take this thing off. Yeah. Oh God, yeah, it's yeah. hot. Oh, but this I'm is just, I'm still getting guilt. groped. Yeah, exactly. And everybody- so I'm still getting groped. It doesn't represent me anymore. I look in the mirror. I don't look like myself. I miss the wind in my hair. It's that simple, you know, and we, we don't we don't get the chance as Muslim women to talk about these things. And I think one of the reasons that we don't get the chance to talk about these things is because we we face such an onslaught of Muslim women are this, Muslim women are that. Hardly any of us have a voice. I'm very lucky in that I have a voice. I'm sitting here across the table talking to you and I have a platform and you know who I am and I've written a book and I have a column, blah, blah, blah. Most Muslim women don't have that. And most Muslim women feel the conversation goes over their head. They don't get a chance to talk. So I wish that our conversation about Muslim women was complicated because we're not monolithic. Uh. We're not... You know, we, it is from the 11 year old girl who's I, who's definitely been forced because what 11 year old has choice, you know, yeah. especially if she's seen all her female relatives. Hey, there's some 50 year olds who are forced out of England to Saudi Arabia. Right? So, so, so exactly. So choice, this, this word of choice, you know, now I understand when you want to, you want to fight the religious right wing or you want to fight the racist right wing and you want to fight the xenophobes and the Islamophobes that you want to create a space there where Muslim women are not just being stereotyped into these helpless victims. I understand. But at the same time, we have to be honest and talk about social pressure. We have to be honest and talk about who determined that what it says in the Quran, it means this headscarf on my head like this. Most of the time it's men. And when you talk to women and that's what it what helped me eventually take it off is that I discovered these Muslim feminists who were saying that's not what it means and helped me wrestle back a meaning of my own to what the headscarf means and how I want to you know get get it get it out of my life and wrestle with that guilt so something that you've done uh rather impressively is that you found your voice you found a, a way to um you found a way to express yourself and to be an individual and also not get lumped in as i'm a i'm a muslim feminist and now i'm in that box so when i talk about muslim feminists i'm talking about you i on hersi ali and anyone else i want that you're not even different people with different uh with different agendas mm-hmm. um and 
one of the things I, I really enjoyed is that when the uh, Arab Spring or however you want the Arab uprising, mm-hmm. when it when it's coming out on CNN and you're a journalist and you're going, no, please, can we not call it chaos in Egypt? Yes. Please, can we call it the uh, the uprising? Yes. We have call it an Arab uprising. I think that's a really important point because for people sitting in the West, which is, you know, millions of people, hundreds of million people, that that's a powerful place yeah. that will very quickly dismiss chaos because yes. chaos, ah, uh, yeah, it doesn't affect it's me. It's those brown people being angry again. Yeah. That's what, because you know, you know what you said about Egypt and how shocking it was for you and your wife to discover the horrendous levels of um, street sexual harassment. And also that I hadn't noticed it when I went on yes, my own. Exactly. And except wife, little ways. Attention. Well, see, Egypt was like that politically with many Americans that I would meet soon after I moved there. Because, you know, I moved in 2000 and they, they couldn't believe that it was a dictatorship because for them, Egypt was the Discovery Channel and National Geographic. And it's King a mausoleum. Hatcher and pyramids, right? Yeah. And the then you'd say, yeah. well, you know, Egypt, ancient Egypt, I studied ancient Egypt in school I love Egypt and I would say to them you know we've been under the same dictator for more than 30 uh, years they'd be like no uh, and I would say to them five US administrations have propped up this one dictator no so when the revolution began they didn't know where it was coming from and I'm like it's you our tax dollars have been going to propping up a dictator we sell weapons not, to him not just Mubarak though. oh That's across all, the region yeah, across the, the region. world like Many Saudi, people, Arabia, yeah. Saudi Arabia I had this, this you know furious debate last night you know those intelligence squared debates um, about Saudi Arabia and how the West should get out of bed with Saudi Arabia because that is the hypocrisy of Western foreign policy. Anyway, so when it came to Egypt and the uprising and the revolution began and Americans were watching it, they just, they didn't know what to do with it because they thought Egypt is our friend, yeah. Egypt is our ally. It's the crown jewel. It's where what, the pyramids what are. Doing? It's the Discovery Channel. Exactly. So how could was, anything be wrong there? So I was like, we are fighting for freedom in the same way that anyone around the world after 30 years of dictatorship fights for freedom. So you weren't, you weren't there. You were in New York yes. during, during the, uh, the uprising and then you went back in November, uh, Mohammed Mahmoud Street, yes. Start with, there I was. There I was in Mohammed Mahmoud Street and I actually was not supposed to be there. I was supposed to be at the European Parliament in Brussels, ironically enough, addressing the European Parliament about women in revolution. But I had been following these amazingly courageous protests on Mohammed Mahmoud Street, a street which is now an icon of the revolution. I was at a conference in Morocco and I was following what was happening where the revolution, us, was pushing back against security forces, the, the army and the police. Going, in, oh the streets, God, in the shields. streets, shields. Yes, because the, the, the security forces had invaded Tahrir Square. Everyone in Tahrir Square was peaceful and they burnt, they set fire to the tents of families who'd lost people in the revolution. Completely unprovoked. So, And there were agent provocateurs there, exactly. certainly, who were like, yeah, against again, and throwing Molotov cocktails and bottles and stuff. And you're like, that's not us. I don't even know that guy. Right. So, so when they did that to the, to the families of the martyrs, as we call them, people in Tahrir Square and, you know, a big role was played. The people who defended those, those, um, families of the, of the martyrs, these football fans called the ultras. And I love these guys because these guys since 2007, they've been in football stadia. And their one goal in life is to fight the police in the football stadium because the police make their lives hell. <laughs> Mubarak's biggest problem. Can you get us jerseys? Oh God, these guys are my heroes, seriously. Some of my best friends are ultras, I really mean it. These guys are our heroes. Mubarak's two biggest mistakes were, he thought, you know what, I'm going to use religion and football as the opium of the people. You know, it's not just uh. religion. So he couldn't close down the mosque. And so the Muslim Brotherhood used it to organize. And he couldn't close down the football stadium because he thought, you know, I'm going to distract the boys with the football. And what the boys did was they formed these fan groups called the Ultras. Now, the Ultras are all over the world. And in Egypt, they became this, these wonderfully kind of, and they encompass all political backgrounds, regardless of religion or working class or middle or upper class. They just want to go to the football match. They have these big things where they, they, have, they do banners and they do entrances and all this. And then they just fight with the police. So when the revolution came, these guys knew how to fight with the police. So they went out there and took that. They took it into Tahrir Square. So they were out there on Mohammed Mahmoud going, fuck you. And I was reading about this, you know, in Morocco going, oh my God, I got to be back in Egypt. So I go to Mohammed Mahmoud Street, an activist friend of mine. What are you wearing? <laughs> Very funny. No, I mean, if you're going for a riot, I know what I'd wear. I, I mean, what I would have worn if anyways. I am wearing a gas mask, most importantly, nice, because yeah. we are suffocating from the amount of tear gas in the air. And so I'm out there with my friend and I, and we're on the front lines, and we make it to the barricades that separate us from the security services. And these plain clothes thugs with the security forces entrapped my friend and I until the riot police came. 
And I realized that they were plain clothes thugs, thugs and, and, and like you said, uh, agent provocateurs and all that. Because as they were waiting for the police to come get us, one of them was trying to take my phone away and the other groped my breast. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You're groping my breast? And the police is sh- firing live ammunition at us. And so, and you know where, it's like, you know when the Incredible Hulk managed to lift that car up when uh, after the accident, right? Before he became the Incredible Hulk, Bruce, Bruce Banner, right? You get this energy that comes out of nowhere, right? So I can see the police is running towards us and this guy's got his hand on my breast. I'm like, ah. So I begin to punch him. I'm <sighs> paneling this guy. And my friend says, Mona, we have to go. This is not the time. The police is coming. I'm like, I am not done. I'm like, get off me, you fucking bastard. And this other guy <laughs> is trying to grab the phone from me. This is this is surreal. surreal oh, you, okay? you have to choose between your phone and your boob. This is exactly. just out of control. <laughs> but I live on Twitter. Twitter <clears throat> is my lifeline. It's Can I, no I, just a, just, a, just a, a quick aside. I, 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 I follow you on Twitter and oh my god you've got like half a million tweets you tweet like a thousand times a day you are uh, you, please watch out for metatarsal metacarpal to thumb syndrome it's a <laughs> rising plague okay so they're they're trying to drag you away yeah, well, your no, friend is saying let's go yeah well they, no they're actually entrapping us you know hand on boob hand on phone and then all of a sudden oh, the riot police come and then th- this abandoned shop where they had entrapped us is empty Everyone's gone, which is which when I that's when I realized that they were planted there to entrap us. They've all gone. They've taken my friend across the street from the shop and they hold his hands behind his back and beat him so badly he needs stitches the next day. But f- he's in a position where he can watch what they're doing to me across the street. But he can't help me because I've got his hands behind his back. I thought he'd managed to escape, but I, re- I realized later that he hadn't. And then he was jailed overnight for 12 hours. In the abandoned shop is me now, surrounded by four or five riot police. Honestly, my first thought, and, and I've got to say, you know, as a feminist, I was surprised I thought this. I thought, you know, it's just me in a shop and it's four riot police. What are they going to do to me? I'm just a woman. <laughs> they showed me what they were going to do to me because those guys had night six this big and they just, wow the fucking living daylights out of me. I was protecting my head like this because I wanted to protect my head and not yes, get a concussion. Turtled up, yes. So they ended up breaking my left arm and with broke, a nightstick. Yes, because they were really whacking hard. And then they broke my right hand in two places. And during that beating, my phone dropped to the floor. And I told you that phone is a lifeline, right? right. So the flow, the floor is on the phone is on the floor. And then they drag me to the no man's land beha- be, between our barricades and their barricades. And there they sexually assaulted me. I was pulling hands out of my trousers, pulling hands off my breasts. They're calling me a whore. They, they're like, what the fuck are you doing here? At one point I fell to the ground. And again, that energy that comes out of nowhere, this voice says to me, if you don't get up now, you're going to die. And remember that image of the woman in Tahrir Square where they're ch- stomping on her chest? Yeah, the blue bra woman. Exactly. If I hadn't got up, they, that's what they would have done to me. So I managed to get up and then they dragged me to their supervising officer who claims he's going to protect me as these hands are all over my body, no protection. And in the very same breath, points to another group of riot police who are going like this and basically says to me, if I wasn't here, you know what they would do to you? I, he's threatening me with gang rape. Oh, Jesus. This is surreal. And then I get taken into the interior ministry for six hours and then military intelligence for another six hours, during which I'm interrogated blindfolded. Now, here's what saved me. In the interior ministry, an activist came into the room for something else, to, to negotiate a truce. And they weren't paying too much attention to me at that time. So I, I go up to him and I go, can you get me on Twitter? So I've got a broken arm and a broken hand, but I need to get on Twitter. So he gets me on Twitter. This is just another example of how the Twitter in the West is different than uh, Twitter yeah, yeah. In, in, other, in other places. Yeah, we don't just tweet, you know, the, yeah. the, the Oscars P- and the Golden P- Globe. Pictures of my cat. No, or, or is- you know, my drunken party last night. This is for real. So he gets me on Twitter and I managed to tweet, beaten, arrested, interior ministry. And then I swear to God, his phone died. The battery just went kaput. So you just got that one last... 10 seconds. I keep, you know, I keep thinking what would have happened if I had not been able to get that tweet out. I don't want to think about what would have happened if I hadn't got that tweet out. And that put the pressure because you were someone. It, but th- and that's why I say I'm very lucky. Despite what happened, because you had your platform, everything that you'd built up being a reporter, everything you'd in in speaking for women and in, yeah. in in raising your own profile, all it of that, me. all of that came down to that one yeah. last. Is that the 10 seconds that he had left in his battery? Now, if I was an ordinary Egyptian woman that nobody knows. And that's the next thing. I would have been gang raped. No doubt. 
I, I might have disappeared into, into the, the, the jails, the Egyptian jails that they have in the interior ministry. I don't know what would have happened to me. What I do know happened is what I found out when I was released, finally. Hashtag Free Mona was trending globally in 15 minutes. Al Jazeera, the Guardian, reported on what happened to me. And the State Department tweeted back at me <laughs> saying, we're working to get you out. Oh, good. I'm incredibly lucky. Yeah, Despite extremely. all of this. And what it speaks to is like, again, like you said, like you're standing on the pyramid of women who have not been able to get that tweet yes. out or who have, yes. you know, who have just been ignored by the and system. At least 12 other women were sexually assaulted in an almost identical way as I was on that street, but none of them has been able to speak. So this is, I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a completely mind boggling thing to me that this, this is, this is going on. And yet we're arguing against people that people take after you they go, yeah, 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 okay. This horrible thing, like the professor Mahmoud at, on, on channel four was Culture. like, this is a horrible thing that happened to Mona and I, I decry it, but yeah, this you part. know, there's, this is, it's such a profound thing that's going on at, at, at the level, like you said, the home, the street and the state. And I don't want to get into the politics of it because we can just get lost down tunnels, but Morsi was in charge of the security forces at that time. No, this was just before Morsi. This was the junta, the time of the junta. But even when Morsi took over, you know what Morsi did? One of the first things he did, he promoted a man called Abdel Fattah Sisi. Who, oh, Al Sisi. Okay, I'm sorry, I've, I've confused, we'll confused the two. Sisi was head of military intelligence when the military sexually violated Egyptian women through these so-called virginity tests. All the military who was involved in those so-called virginity tests should have been fired. Sisi was promoted to defense minister. A year later, Sisi overthrows Morsi. So you see what our yeah, men do? Our just men just back. play musical chairs it with each other. Okay, okay. The, the, the politics of it is, is insane and, and mm -hmm. we can get into... Talk to me about your tattoos. Ah. My, my, my wife, um, when she fled from her husband, uh, who was an abusive rapist, if I find the fucker. Um, yeah, anyways. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's... But you know, it's, she's she's for, she's forgiven him in a really kind of uh, she's she's Buddhist and in in, mm -hmm. in a way that she's like let go. He doesn't have any control over her mm -hmm. because she's forgiven him. But one mm -hmm. of the things she did, and I think a lot of survivors of of traumatic events do, is she's she tattooed half her body with merkabas uh, from from her calves to oh. her elbows. And um, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, it's <laughs> quite the intense tattoo, mm -hmm. but. People who go through that, that's, that's a reaction. They do mm -hmm. something to reclaim their bodies. Yes. Talk to me about yours. Well, you know, after, so after I was finally released and, you know, during those 12 hours of detention, I kept saying I need medical attention because my arms looked like the elephant man, you know, <laughs> they were just bruised beyond recognition. So when yeah, I, was I saw the photos released, in the hospital, you've got, uh, you've got like, yeah, the, you know, green and black. And you've also been accused of not having this attack of this not happening. That's another plane of existence yeah, altogether that I made this up, yeah. that I did this for attention. Oh, but I, under Sharia law, you have to have four witnesses, four male witnesses who've got, uh, you know, photographic evence or whatever it is. Is that, is that not, is that not right? Right. Some of the haters on Twitter, that's for rape. Yeah. In, oh, for rape. in countries like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Oh, so for sexual assault, you only jail. need two. Oh, I don't know how many they need for sexual assault. But when it came to me, the haters, they were claiming that I made this up so I could be on TV. And I'm like, dude, there are less painful ways to get on TV than to get my arms broken. Are you kidding I've, me? I've also been on, been on, been on TV. A million times. Mm. Why do I need to pretend I was sexually assaulted? Tattoos, stick with me. Tattoos. Anyway, so I go and get, and get my x-rays done. And well, honestly, when they told me you have fractures in both arms, I thought they were kidding. And then I find myself in, you know, those old plaster of Paris casts all the way up to here. I'm like Frankenstein, right? Oh, right. So I had to, because that's, that's all they had in this private hospital in well, Egypt. Well, with the metal strut underneath and holding up your arms? Yeah, or? Your arms are just like this because it's, it's a plaster of Paris, right? Right, yeah. So you're like this. So I had to go back to New York because I couldn't do anything for myself. I couldn't brush my teeth. I couldn't brush my hair. I couldn't dress myself. So I go back to New York and I realize I'm told that I need surgery because the bone in my left arm broke in such a way that it needed to be realigned so it could fuse. And, and the ortho doctor put, uh, so I have a titanium plate with five screws in my arm and it does not beep in the airport because people always ask that. So, and then he gives me this wonderful thing called Vicodin. I don't know about you, but Vicodin is a fucking amazing drug. I'm on it now. <laughs> oh my God. I would sit so there. So Pete. <laughs> Pete mainlines the stuff. Vicodin. I was like, I'm going to write 10 books right now in five minutes. Vicodin is amazing and highly addictive, I must warn. Don't play with this, kids, if you're listening at home. Anyway, I'm on Vicodin and... You know, there's a part of me that is totally detached from what happened to me. It's almost like it happened to somebody else. 
And there's a part of me that is furious. And there's a part of me that hasn't cried yet. And there's a part of me that a few days after my surgery, hears from my mother that a childhood friend was killed at a later, a protest a few days after what happened to me. And he grew up to be this cleric of the revolution. And, and he, we believe he was targeted because he was one of those clerics that didn't sell out and say things like, don't rise up against the leader because he was out there on the street saying things like, the air in Tahrir Square is purer than the air in Mecca, which is the holiest site for Muslims, which is where I was groped. So they had a cleric who was connecting religion and revolution and they hate that. So I'm I'm high on Vicodin and all these things are happening. I see this woman dragged through Tahrir Square. I hear that thousands of women go and march out of anger and in support of her. And I finally start to cry. This was the first time because this Egyptian woman tweeted me and she said to me, you know, after what happened to you and then after what happened, we heard about all those other women. And now this woman who was dragged through Tahrir Square, thank you for speaking out because because of all of you, we're now in Tahrir and we're angry and we're not going to let this happen again. I just, I saw this woman's tweet. She said, I was out there marching for you and for that woman in Tahrir. I just burst into tears. So I, I, was, I sat there and I thought, you know, I've got to celebrate surviving somehow because I survived. You know, and others didn't survive. So I promised myself that when my bones healed, and I say when my bones healed, not when my heart healed, because that still has a ways, a ways to go. So I was like, when my bones heal, I'm going to dye my hair bright red. And I announced this on Twitter just to commit myself, <laughs> yeah. you know. Bright red, because bright red says, I'm here, you fucking shits. And you have not killed me. I survived. And then I'm going to get tattoos on both arms because I'm very proud of this scar where I had my surgery, but I didn't choose it. Let me see. It's right here. It's very faint. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm there. Yeah. I will never cover it up, but I didn't choose this mark, but I, I'm choosing these marks. I never wanted tattoos before this. And so it was a way of reclaiming, reclaiming my body. Reclaiming your body, yeah. It was saying, you know, I'm making those marks intentionally. So the first tattoo I got is the ancient Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. She is the Love goddess it. of retribution and sex, both of which I say yes to. And the way I describe her is Sekhmet. Now, she, she has the head of a lioness and she has the body of a woman. And the way that my friend rendered her in this illustration is she's all tits and hips and stuff. So she's, you know, she's very womanly. The way I describe Sekhmet. Oh, yeah, she's she's a looker. I mean, I'm not I'm not really into the lion headed type, but if if I was that what she would be anyways. Yes, I'm into the lion headed type and she's mine. Yeah, good. <laughs> anyway, so the way it's the, quite a nice tattoo. And believe me, I've seen a few. She's lovely and she's very powerful. And the way that I describe Sekhmet is first she'll kick your head in, then she'll fuck your brains out. That's Sekhmet. That's her power. And then my other tattoo is on this arm here and it's got, it's Arabic calligraphy. And, and up here is the name of that street, Muhammad Mahmoud, because it's now an icon of the revolution. And underneath it is the Arabic word for freedom, which is Horeya, because we were liberated on that street. So those, so far they're the only two, but I'm planning on getting many more. Okay, so this sort of leads into um, my first girlfriend, uh, just just for, for my, <clears throat> my feminist credentials. Uh, she was... Uh, uh, a women's studies major at UC Santa Cruz and uh, we were together for six years the first big love and she was raised uh, as a fundamentalist Baptist Christian when I first spoke to her mother after we'd been together for two years her first question was have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as, as your savior so this 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 lovely girl grew up totally repressed you know virginity guarded the whole thing and um we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, she's and and it was, uh, you know, it was a huge thing for her to actually to you know to surrender herself to me, and we were together. For, I felt like you know this this sort of the sense of honor yeah. that I was going to take. You know, I was like, wow, you know, this she's she's you know, I, I, this is a huge responsibility. Yeah. However, now that repression, she is a total. She's gone totally polyamorous, <laughs> and you can see her in the Beta Breakers run, running naked from San Francisco to Marin. Okay, <laughs> so this is what happens. I have another. Yes. I have another friend who, who was raised insanely Catholic like you know sat on the whole virginity kept inside going to church the nuns yes. she ended up becoming a stripper so she could meet hot girls okay then then decided that you know she didn't want to deal with all the men involved in that mm -hmm. and then she went on to make adult leather goods there you go. for you know there sex you go. toys made of leather which i won't even describe because they make me blush so <laughs> So you've come out of a repressive society. You've come out of Saudi Arabia. Mona, have you ever been skinny dipping? Um, okay, you know what? I don't know how much... How many people listen to your show? Oh, just a couple. <laughs> Thousand. I don't know how much I should reveal because this is going into my next book. After I get permission from some people in Egypt. I, yeah, I see. I cannot tell you this because I, because I have, honestly, people's safety 
is at stake. So, right. and, and this is wow, just, that's some dangerous skinny I know, dipping. I, know, I mean, right? or alleged skinny <laughs> dipping. Something happened. Yeah. I cannot tell you right now. I, I know the I know the answer, but I won't say it. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have to buy my next book, Ian. Okay, <laughs> I, you know I will. I'm, I'm no, really no, enjoying. But, but you know, but you know that. It, as a way of evading your question, but also answering it, here's the thing. The best revenge is to live well. And when I tell people about the guilt that I experienced after taking off my hijab, and when I tell people, when I write about the guilt after I finally had sex, I tell people, you know, don't feel sorry for me because I fucked the guilt out of my system. <laughs> so I am fine. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of a freak, but... Uh... <laughs> Hey, no, hey. no, sorry. I, I mean that in the best possible way. I, I would never slut shame. I love the sluts. No, that's not what I mean. Okay, okay. Ian, yes, behave. sorry. I'm behaving. Yes, sorry, sorry, Mona. You can slap my hand if you want. Um, no, you probably get off on it. No, stay on your side. Damn it. <laughs> Pete, you, you need, you're going to need to break out that paddle Here's later. Okay. Thing, the ping pong bat. Yeah, the bat. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Shall I smack you? Yeah, go ahead. Go on, oh, do it, do it. Come on. Oh, come on. That was supposed to be for. for all right. Thank you. Um, so. <laughs> Something in in Islam that's not brought up enough, in my opinion, and definitely in yours, which is another thing I love, is Khadijah. Oh, as hero. Being, yeah, she's fantastic. Why is she never mentioned when we talk? It's always Aisha is yes. brought up both by both West and yes. and uh, and Islam. Is exactly. it's used to justify child marriage in exactly. Yemen and Iraq? That exactly. uh, Muhammad was his third bride, was eight or nine. Yes. Yes. And uh, but Khadijah never gets a look in. Yeah, she was. You 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 yeah. you, you well, tell me. Khadijah was I'm not going to mansplain. Thank Khadijah. you, my yeah. my feminist hero. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate that. No, no, you know Khadijah. You know Khadijah is considered a mother of the believers because that's what Muhammad's wives are called. They're called the mothers of the believers. But that, you know, that's where it stops. And the reason I think that the clerics don't talk about Khadija enough is that she is a woman of her own stature. You know, this woman was a rich businesswoman. She had lots of caravans that would go up and down the kind of the trade routes. She employed Muhammad. She was 15 years older than him. She was twice widowed, twice divorced, you know, several um, marriages before Muhammad. And then she proposes to him when she's 40 and he's 25. Now, I have a thing for younger men. So I was joke. just going to ask, would you consider dating 15 years younger and taking care of him? It has happened. Really? <laughs> nice so, one. What was he? Was he a guitarist? Down in his luck? <laughs> You're going to kill me. <laughs> Ian. Sorry. <laughs> Let me focus. Focus. No, 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 no. She's no. blushing. Wow. I'm yeah. not. I just need water. Right. Help. Is there water? Is there water? <laughs> No, no, listen. Khadija is really important. Khadija is the first person who became a Muslim. Khadija is the person who told Muhammad, you're not crazy, I believe in you. And the reason that I think Khadija is really important when we fight things like child marriage is that the clerics will tell the activists in Yemen it's blasphemous to even try and talk about ending child marriage because it's the Prophet's tradition, quote-unquote sunnah, yeah? And... I honestly don't care how old Aisha was. Some people say six, some nine, some say 19. I say in 2015, it's a crime to have sex with children. End of story. So thank you very much for this lovely water. And But when it comes to Khadija, I want them to talk more and more about her. Because, you know, we first of all, we talk about the sunnah, the tradition of the prophet and how we must emulate him. So being a woman who has a thing for younger men, I would like more younger men in the region to emulate that. Number one. Number two, we talk about unemployment and, you know, poverty among <laughs> young men in the Middle East, okay? I'm like, you know what? There's a solution yeah. for that. And the solution is to tell our young men to marry older women like Khadija, who are, you know, have businesses, who have money and who can take care of you. I am like she did with Muhammad. You have made me feel so much better. Not that I felt bad at all of my wife being older and the main breadwinner of the family. I salute so, you both. Yes, no, she's. I, I don't know where I would where I would be without her. So, what, what I love about the message and you bringing women is essentially women's rights in the Arab world is that it splits people. It takes them off script. How do you deal with the neocons jumping on your case and going, ah, see those Muslims over yeah. there are treating their women horribly. And uh, yes. therefore we need to send more B 52s loaded up with loaded up with guns to solve their problems. Yeah. Cause it seems to me that the obvious thing is to turn around and go, ah, oh, so reproductive rights in your country are not the no, thing. So it pulls yeah. it. How do you, how do you, Fend for that because Foreign Policy Magazine, where your original article that you yes. spun into the book, uh, I'll do just quick, quick finish mansplaining here. Um, <laughs> why they hate us, they being Arab men, us being women. Um, that was that was in Foreign Policy Magazine, which is many people will call a right wing. Uh, it's kind of like middle, isn't it? Uh, middle ground writing. It was, it was telegraph. 
how do you defend yourself from that sort of people trying to grab your cause and make it part of their B-52 bomb Tehran campaign or what have you? Exactly. Well, you know, the, that abhorrent camp, you know, who call, you know, the, the talk about the Muslims and the Arabs. I mean, my immediate response. And to the Koran. And the Koran, that's right. And the Iran and the Iraqs. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's amazing. God bless Texas. <laughs> Yeehaw! I'm going to Houston and Dallas as my last two dates of my U.S. tour. Great. Can you imagine me in Dallas? I can imagine you bulking <laughs> up security is a good idea. I've, I've got, a, I've got a, a friend out there and he's gay and he comes from an evangelical background and it took him until he turned 31 to be able to come out and he's totally abandoned religion and everything to do with religion. And I was like, Randy, I'm going to need you in your car because we might have to do a Thelma and Louise when I'm done with Dallas. <laughs> and we're just going to have to be like, you know, be running out there in the desert, you know, wind blowing through our hair. Okay, this is what I tell the Muslims and Arabs crowd. I tell them that, you know, I, I was teaching at the University of Oklahoma and one of my students, and I recount the story in my book, announced to the class that she promised her virginity in a virginity pledge to her father, not her mother, to her father in a purity ball. And she promised her father she would remain a virgin until she got married, i.e. when he gave her, handed her over to another man. Okay. So these Muslims, Arab types, you know, who call us that, I tell them, you are the Christian Brotherhood of the United States. Yeah, for sure. And I fight you and I fight the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States. And the thing that connects you both, and I've said this so many times, I need to get this written on a t-shirt, is you're obsessed with my vagina and my message to you both is stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. That's my message to the right wing. Okay. Well, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to argue with that. Um, where, I, where I feel personally is I have issues with some things that go on in my own neighborhood. I'm not comfortable. And I feel like if I were to say, hey, you know, I think Fatima over there would be real happy playing on the jungle gym with her brother at the age of 12 wearing, you know, trousers and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a t-shirt. Mm. So th then there's the, so then there's the liberal side of things. Mm. And I feel like when you argue women's rights in, in the Middle East with the left-leaning crowd, it's almost like you're talking about pedophilia. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, the ancient Greeks used to used to shag little boys, and mm -hmm. we, and and everyone recoils in horror. You're saying, well, you know, shouldn't shouldn't women have equal rights? Shouldn't they? Well, mm -hmm. it's their culture. It's Arab oh, culture. They've had this culture. whole thing. We right. want to be multicultural. We want yeah. to be inclusive. We want yeah. to be pluralistic. How do you? That right. that seems to be a harder a harder yeah. uh, uh, road to hoe. I don't want to use that word, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's to a plow. to plow. That, that's a, that's also problematic. There's, but it's difficult. How do you yes. deal with the left leaning? Yes. Like, Oh, how we can't uh, Ben Affleck, for instance, jumping right. up on Bill Maher going, you people are gross stereotyping. Well, that big Bill Maher incident, you had, you know, three white men discussing Muslims. I'm like, hello, can there be one, one Muslim at least around the table to talk in the name of Islam? Uh. So yes, yeah, so we're constantly, like I said, we're constantly talked about it's the conversation usually happens over our heads. Now, if, if to the right wing, I say to them, look, there's plenty of misogyny to go around in the US. Misogyny hasn't been erased anywhere. Look at what you've done to reproductive rights, all the abortion clinics that have been closed down, the, the rates of sexual assault. Do you remember that girl who graduated at Columbia University carrying, carrying a, the mattress? A mattress yeah, yeah, and the yeah. president wouldn't even shake her hand because she said her boyfriend raped her and they didn't take it seriously. So, you know, so there are problems. Talk about, talk about wearing US. a hijab. I well, mean, exactly, wear, wear right? a mattress. She carried this mattress around on campus in New York in 2015. Yeah. So, you know, so we have plenty of misogyny. No one can throw stones at anyone here. Okay. But when it comes to the left, what I tell them is, look, if you are silent about cultural practices that harm girls and women, then not only are you enabling those cultural practices, but you're practicing this soft racism of lower expectations. Cultural relativism is really harmful. And if, and you know, I understand the leftist desire not to feed the right wing kind of ammunition, you know, by giving them the excuse to be racist. But at the same time, I want the left to understand that there are voices like mine and others like the South Hall Black Sisters in this country, for example, and others called Daughters of Eve who are fighting against female genital mutilation. Now, these women, they're, they're women of color. These women are women who are Muslim and British. These are women who come from Somali backgrounds, Kenyan backgrounds, Pakistani, Bangladeshi backgrounds. So I, my message to the left is, don't interfere. I understand that, you know, it's not your fight. It's our fight. But listen to the women who are talking about that fight. And instead of getting in their way and acting like you're going to protect Islam from us, amplify their voices and listen to their voices.
this is where I may where I have a slight disagreement is that you argue that that people in the West should look after women in the West and leave leave people to their uh, in in their own yes. cultures to their fight. Yes. But it seems to me a sort of a trickle down feminism, like where the rich get richer, where the people who where, where women obviously equality is the goal, mm. but. Th- where the help is needed is where they're, you know, is where they're burning women in the streets for, you know, they're or burning them on the riverbank for because they said they burned the Quran or, right. you know, these horrible hate crimes. That's but where. What, what what here can you do about about that? There's, the only thing you can do about that is talk to your elected representative and say, look, we have to hold the government of this ca- country accountable. But you can't fly in there as a white savior to save the women. This is the women's struggle on the ground. Mm. Okay, so I, I'd like to sort of wrap this up with. Um, uh, an anecdote about my mother. <laughs> so riddle me this. It's a hot day in Seattle. It's 100 degrees. Are you from Seattle? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I, but I've lived up there. I'm an right. itinerant wanderer uh, kind of right. kind of person. And it's a, it's 100 degrees, and she and her friends have taken shelter in a Macy's. I think yeah. it's a Macy's. Big department store. Right. And at the perfume counter is a woman in a niqab. Yes. Okay? And my mother... She's 71 years old. She she rides her bike 100 miles a week. Yes. She is a terrier, okay? Yes. Yes. And she just can't help herself. And, yes. it, and she turns to this woman and walks over. She goes, excuse me, it's 100 degrees outside. We burned our bras in the 60s, okay? We fought for the rights to have mm-hmm. equal pay. Mm-hmm. And you're going to come in here wearing this at 100, you know, over 100 degrees? Mm-hmm. You can't be comfortable in that. And the woman, you know, her friends are trying, my mom's friends are trying to pull her away. Mm-hmm. And the woman says, well, it's, you know, this is my culture and this is my job. She says, your culture, give me a break. I saw your husband. He's outside wearing shorts and a t-shirt smoking. And you're hiding in here in air conditioning. What do you have to say to my mom? Oh, my goodness. Okay, you know, it's funny that this happened in Seattle, you know, because my last stop in in the the last part of my U.S. book tour was in Seattle. I was reading an Elliott Bay Book Company, my favorite bookstore, because I used to live in Seattle um, for two years in the 2000s, 2002. And a woman put her hand up and she said, you know, (coughs) excuse me, she said, I wasn't, I didn't know who you were, but I was walking down the street the other day and I saw a woman in niqab and I was honestly shocked and horrified that after years of, you know, feminism in the, in the US, this woman is here covered in, in black from head to toe. And so I went to go, I went and Googled, you know, veil. She goes, first name that came up was yours. And I saw that you were going to read at Elliott Bay today. So I came so I could ask you. It's almost the exact same scenario. Here's my my response to her. I said to her, you know, this is how I feel honestly when I'm asked these questions. There's a part of me as a Muslim woman that wants to say, mind your own business. And there's a part of me that wants to defend something that I find indefensible. Because, because then it's like, you know, the, 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 my background and my people, even though I detest the niqab and I want to ban the niqab, huh? But I said to her, but you And know, I've campaigned against it in France. It, it, I, no, I haven't campaigned in France, but I've supported the ban even though I hate Sarkozy because I think he's a racist shit, but that's another matter. But but here's the thing. When, I, when I'm confronted with a question like that, my, my instinct is leave it to us to fight this because, because... Did you hear the other day about the Stamford um, Hasidic Jews who want to ban women from driving? Yes. This is happening in London. Okay? Yes. So I want people to go up to the Stanford Hasidic Jews and say, excuse me, I bought my but that is, I mean, can't but, do that. Okay, but you're talking, again, you're talking, thing, um, Ian? it's the same thing, but it's, I mean, if you want to talk the numbers, there's a couple of crackpots and there's also an Arab preacher who just got up and said, oh, if you nice. masturbate, your hands will get pregnant. He was Turkish, but yes, oh, exactly. Turkish. Okay, but, but right. no, it's not about numbers. <laughs> it's about misogyny. Listen, listen. But, but you know, you know what happens? Here's the thing. When, when your, your mother goes and says that, and I'm, you know, more power to your mother for burning a bra, being a feminist. You know what it ends up doing? It ends up creating a defensiveness, which yes. just ends up putting the fight way back. So I told this woman, listen, I detest the niqab. Believe me, there are enough of us in the Muslim community that are fighting it. If you just just step aside and go fight the misogyny that concerns you directly, let me handle this fight. Because if you enter into this fight, defensiveness is Defensive going to get in Defensive mechanisms, absolutely. So go well, on, this is go why on. we're so glad that you're here doing this, what you're doing, because the discomfort that you're causing on the right and on the left, exactly. that... That discomfort, that's the fulcrum. That's where change is happening. That's that the cut. That is the razor. You may not be completely right on things, but you're, what you're doing is you're dividing people and you're bringing them together at the same time. Mona, I'm so glad you came on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, I will say, though, that with your bare arms and your craven idol tattooed on your arm <laughs> that you are not practicing proper Islam, you are actually practicing monotheism. And with that note... <laughs> I will yeah, ask fuck you. you. Oh, <laughs> you're the first 
podcast to actually say fuck you to my face, Mona. While I while I say it, will you please sign my Kindle? How can I sign your Kindle? Well, you see, it's with right. Sharpie? Yeah, with a Sharpie. See, okay, I've, I've, you, I if you to. want, I can show you that your book is in here, but you'll just oh. have to believe me. So well, you know, they've got to come up with ways that we can sign Kindle. There we are. Right? Please, please going. sign my Kindle. Oh, my We've had two there. people, including Abdul uh, Barry Atwan, who's the oh, head of Ryle okay. Yume, who was here yes, last week. I know he tried to sign the bloody screen. Oh no, no, you can't do that, dude. Come on. His, his work right. is more important than anything. I'm Ian Wynn. You've been listening to Latopia After Dark. I've just been told uh, to go fuck myself or words to that <laughs> words to that effect by none other than Mona El Tahawe. I urge you to read her book, uh, Hymens and Headscarves. Headscarves and Hymens. Headscarves and Hymens. Sorry, I always put the... I, I, That's your priority. I, I, didn't, yeah? I didn't want to bury the lead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, please check us out on Latopia.com. Go to our Facebook page, Latopia After Dark. Uh, Mr. Peter Cox, super agent, has been here manning the microphones. Mona, thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Hello, I'm Eric Beck Rubin, hardcore out of control book enthusiast inviting you to listen to a new show here on Latopia called Burning Books. Every three weeks, we put out a new podcast on a single book. It could be a recent debut, a classic, fiction, nonfiction, and everything in between. The idea is to explore what lies at the heart of great books, books that try to be great but don't quite make it, as well as, now and then, books that are irredeemably bad. So check out our archive shows on Latopia, and we'll look forward to having you join us for our next podcast. Burning Books, exclusively from Latopia.com.